to my mind, it represents an astounding abdication of reason. And I say so in full responsibility because if one looks at this measure, at, at numerous levels, this measure defies reason. The most elementary level is the following. Suppose the government was going to do something of this kind. There was absolutely no need for it to say that the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes would have no value from tonight onwards. Suppose there was a target date. By that target date, old notes could have been exchanged for new notes. But until that target date, there was no reason why the old notes should actually have been declared non-legal tender. In other words, in the past, again, we have had situations in which old notes have been phased out. And they may even be phased out within a particular time horizon. But it has never been associated with declaring old notes non-legal tender. Much of the panic, much of the crowds that we see today could have been avoided if the legal tender status of the old notes could have continued until the target date by which these notes had to end. So at one level, at the most elementary level, there is a defiance of reason. Secondly, to imagine that this is something which is going to put an end to black money represents again a defiance of reason. It is an absolute misunderstanding of the nature of black money. Black money does not consist of hordes of currency. It does not consist of stacks of currency notes put into suitcases or hold dolls or buried under the ground or put into trunks. Black money really is a reference to an entire set of black or illegal or undeclared activities. These activities generate income. Consequently, black money is something which is a shorthand way of referring to an undeclared set of activities. Now, let us just imagine for a moment that 14 lakh crores of rupees have been declared non-legal tender. That's the figure. Let us even assume that even though the black economy in the country, it may be about a quarter, third of the total economy, total white economy, let's assume that as much as half of these 14 lakh crores is in fact held in or used for circulating uh, fund, uh, circulating incomes and goods and so on in the black economy. So 7 lakh crores is in that economy. The size of the black economy in such a case would be, let's say, a quarter of the white economy, say about 35 lakh crores. Out of these 7 lakh crores, let us imagine that 30% would become completely useless. As you know, in capitalism, whenever any such thing happens, new businesses come up illegally for exchanging old notes for new notes. I was in Hyderabad a couple of days ago, and the going rate there was quite favorable. That you give me a thousand rupees, I'll give you 900. In Delhi, I believe it is 700. So let's assume that 30% of these 7 lakh was actually going to be lost to those who held these in the black economy. That would come to 2 point lakh crores. Now, you find that out of the 35 lakh crores, less than the share of profits at a conservative estimate is about 50%. That means 17 and a half. So out of 17 and a half, just about two, out of 17 and a half lakh crores of profits, the impounding of this black money is something which would amount to a loss about 2.5 lakh, which means not more than 10%. Now, does any economy come to an end because 10% of the annual profits are, on one occasion, lost as far as those engaging, as far as the black operatives are concerned? It is an amazing 
confusion between stocks and flows because the government appears to believe that the entire economy consists of holding notes. But the moment you see the economy as consisting of a set of activities on which surplus is generated, profits are earned, and that activity requires notes for circulating the, 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 the goods and services within that sector, like in any other business, then it's clear that as far as this measure is concerned, it will have a trivial impact as far as the total size of the black economy, total operation of the black economy are concerned. But there is an even more significant point, namely, let us for a moment assume, let's for a moment concede everything that the government has claimed. Let us assume that because of this measure, let us even forget the transitional pains of the people. Because of this measure, let us assume that in two days' time, all old notes would have actually been exchanged for new notes. That there was no problem with ATMs, no problem with banks, everything went exactly as the government had claimed. And let us assume that this actually created a shortage of currency in the black economy. Okay, because the black economy, as the Prime Minister has proudly proclaimed, notes are being burnt, notes are being, being kind of thrown into the Ganges or whatever. Let us actually assume that this would have created a shortage of notes in the black economy. Does that mean that the economy would have come to an end? Those activities, as long as they remain profitable, for financing them, if the current notes, if the current cash holds become irrelevant, get lost, then they would demand new cash holds. Like any business, if the business is profitable, it would require working capital. When new cash holds would be demanded, or new cash would be demanded for, 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 as working capital for that particular segment, the demand for money in the economy would have gone up. If that happens, then interest rates would go up. And this is assuming everything that the government claims actually comes to pass. If the interest ra rates go up, effectively you would have a shift of cash from the white to the black economy. In fact, the interest rates would go up until there is an adequate shift of cash from the white to the black economy. And how would that shift of cash come about? Through a shrinking of the white economy. Therefore, attacking the black economy through demonetizing notes actually constitutes not an attack on the black economy, but an attack on the white economy. This is assuming all the assumptions of the government are fulfilled, and this is assuming that we are not talking about the transitional pains. Suppose there are no transitional pains at all. But, of course, there are transitional pains. I mean, for any government to actually demonetize 86% of the total currency, when 70% of your population depends entirely on currency is really an astounding abandonment of reason. I mean, this is, this is just incredible uh, thinking. This is a complete astounding uh, abandonment of reason. Besides, this is supposed to be part of a move to a cashless economy. Now, just imagine, what, what is the cashless economy? That when, I, when I do not use cash but make a payment, what is it that I'm doing? I'm actually transferring a claim which I have on a bank to someone else. In other words, instead of, a, instead of cash, cash consists of the liability of the Reserve Bank of India. Therefore, when I pay by cash, I'm transferring a claim on the Reserve Bank of India to somebody else. But the idea is, let's not transfer claims on the Reserve Bank of India, let's transfer claims on the banking system. Even when I pay by a credit card, so it's nothing to do with plastic, paper, check, this, that and the other. All payment represents a transference of claim upon a financial institution, namely a bank, to some other person. Now, suppose I pay by a credit card, then effectively, if I pay by SBI credit card, the SBI has told me that, look here, up to whatever the ceiling is, 1,50,000, we, we, we make claims of that order of magnitude against ourselves available to you. So you just pay with it. So all payment is 
a, 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 a shift, a transfer of claims to somebody else, claims upon the bank. All right. Now, this implies, however, that the bank allows you to set up a claim against itself. And if the bank allows you to set up a claim against itself, you must be credit worthy. Now, half the Indian population is not considered, more than half the Indian population is not considered credit worthy by the banking system. Many of you would have known that after bank nationalization, while there was an insistence, for instance, that the nationalized banks must give, amount, give, about, give out a certain amount of credit as priority sector lending, let's say, to peasant agriculture, to the agricultural sector, this is something which is now done away with, more or less. That what every study shows, that institutional credit is withdrawing from agriculture, withdrawing from the informal sector, withdrawing as far as petty producers are concerned. Because of which they are going to a new class of money lenders. The liabilities of those money lenders cannot be used as money. It's only the liabilities of the banking system that can be used as money. And the banking system is withdrawing from providing credit to the particular sector, whether it's agriculture, informal sector, petty production, or what have you. In such a case, to talk about a cashless economy, it just makes absolutely no sense, because a cashless economy in which transactions are settled by shifting claims upon the banking system, be they in plastic or be they uh, as, as, as checks, is something which simply, which simply is a chimera if it is the case that the banking sector does not consider more than half of your population credit worthy. Now, therefore, at every level, the decision which has been taken and the vision which has been put before the country represents, to my mind, an abdication of reason. I'll end by saying that this is an extremely dangerous situation for a very simple reason, namely, this abdication of reason is carried to a point where the greater the pains of the people, the greater is supposed to have in the courage of those who took the decision. Therefore, we have a celebration of pain. The greater the pains of the people, look how courageous the man was who took this decision. And this view, to an extent, may even be internalized by the victims of this decision. In other words, there is a peculiar dialectic between the abandonment of reason on the one, the abdication of reason on the one side and silent suffering, distress without resistance on the other side, with the media playing a typically sub subservient role and a host of celebrities being trotted along to kind of sing hosannas to this particular step which has been taken. This is an extraordinarily dangerous situation and I think this situation must be resisted. Thank you very much.